My name is Dr. Jennifer Beller, and I am the Artistic Director of the Next Tet New Music Series here at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Welcome to our first Next Tet Variety Show, produced entirely by the Next Tet team. This show will feature some of our student and faculty performers and composers discussing and playing new music. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to Next Step's first variety show. This video features a viola interview and discussion with Michaela Nielsen, Rizwan Jagani, and John Rose, a mini student composer spotlight on Brittany Benton, a saxophone interview and discussion with Dr. Shauna Pennock and Zach Arthur, a composer interview and discussion with Professor Samuel Friend and Melanie Walsh, a mini student composer spotlight with Kaber Smith, a collaboration interview and discussion with Dr. Jennifer Beller, Sean Cleave, and Melanie Walsh, and to top it all off, a pre-concert talk and performance by Logan Strong featuring the Honors College Ensemble. We are so excited to have you, and just in case you haven't already, click the thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment with your favorite music pun. We hope you enjoy the video. The idea behind this is to talk a little bit about with how viola repertoire is, how would we rely on contemporary music in the sense of people writing for the instrument because there's not so much stuff written for us in that sense. I mean, we do have an expansive repertoire, but a lot of what people have been playing recently has, you know, been more contemporary. My experience with contemporary is less about new works for viola <laughs> and more about you know the cross genre people taking existing music and putting strings in it and that's like all the work i was doing in vegas so it's like i was playing contemporary music but it wasn't classical contemporary i mean and my my piece that i'm bringing up is kind of um pushing the boundaries of what classical music is because it's not like it, it's a lot of like rock and roll and like bluegrass it's just funny because like the like the andre memari viola sonata I just discovered by accident. Within that classical genre, you're already bringing in new cultural elements because that's a Brazilian piece. So mm -hmm. a lot of what makes Brazilian music like recognizable is in this sonata, like the fast driving rhythms and Brazilian waltzes, which really aren't sort of like, you know, your Strauss one, two, three, one, two, three. It's more just like lyricism that carries over the, in the sort of jazzy feel to it. So um, then would you say, I, I would say the last hundred years, the direction music takes, like the forward direction it's taking is incorporating less Western European stuff. A lot of that comes with the, uh, the push, especially lately, to diversify classical music, mm -hmm. to make it more accessible to other cultures and to um, just pull away from that um what what some people have been calling now is that shankirian superiority <laughs> it's interesting because i had a discussion with a mentor of mine and we weren't even talking about classic like western classical we were calling it serious art music in mm. which it's more the setting as opposed to the culture mm. in which that setting encompasses many cultures so you can have like a piece like you can have a brahms symphony coupled with, you know, a contemporary Brazilian suite or, you know, a piece by Chinese composer and you hear those elements in their music and it would still be considered serious art music in classical music setting as opposed to just European Western classical. composers now really think about what the viola adds to a modern piece 
and likes to give us some limelight because clearly the violinists and cellists have plenty of stuff. What I discovered with, um, so I discovered Kenji Bunch just scrolling through YouTube. I mean, he's a very proficient violist himself. He teaches viola at a university out in Oregon. He's a Juilliard trained. He was playing the national anthem for an NBA game. And it's a fantastic arrangement that he did himself. And so then I, I saw that video and then I started just started just looking into him because it was it was my 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 time of just getting into the viola. I was just really starting to get into viola. And um, then I discovered this piece, the three G's, and there are so many recordings of violas doing it on YouTube. And um, and then uh, Kenji Bunch even did a viol uh, a video explaining the techniques that he wrote and his notation, because uh, he said that some of the, some of the things in the um, that he wrote in the edition probably weren't the most idiomatic, and so he just kind of further explained in a YouTube video, which actually helps a lot. With that, uh, with that scordatura tuning, which he modeled after bluegrass, um, a bluegrass violin, uh, having the low string, uh, the C string tuned down to a G, G stays the same, then it's the D stays the same, mm -hmm. and then the A string tunes down a step to a G, and so there's a lot of really cool open string chords that you can come up with uh with that with that specific tuning but then having like the just like a pushing like a rock and roll vibe on it too michaela you talked a little bit about how your sort of exposure to contemporary music was sort of strings viola in you know non-classical settings mm -hmm. in performance and I feel like you know that in and of itself is a huge exposure that I feel is necessary as performers now Definitely. in terms of performance practice because like John says that there's so many recordings of the three G's but if you have not been exposed to bluegrass or fiddling or a different style outside of classical your three g's is going to sound like a classical musician playing three g's versus yeah. somebody who has had exactly. exposure to different styles who can rock out and make that piece something special but i yeah i think that that is part of the direction things are going though is that if if i mean you can have a full career doing only classical music but prior to the pandemic and hopefully after when we get to play unless you're a versatile mm -hmm. musician and you can play these different styles, you're not going to get as many gigs, I should say. But yeah, some of the things that, that, you know, I was doing in Vegas, um, you know, all electric and then doing rock music with all electric mm -hmm. instruments for that sound. And then the other main thing I was doing, you've been there before Rizwan with pop, yeah. uh, a big band, but rather than a horn section, it was, amplified acoustic string instruments even from a performance practice standpoint you guys had to imitate the sound of horns mm -hmm. like you know no vibrato very pure tone with you know power and clarity and projection as mm -hmm. opposed to you know a rich colorful full sound that mm -hmm. you know with vibrato that you get from you know typically you see with string players you have to think about bowing because you have to imitate breath even. yeah like mm -hmm. even those little details can like can pull that away, and so that's very interesting. Yeah, that that's mine, and I know you you do things too, Rizwan, with your pickup and. Yeah, with my like, because I do a lot of Bollywood and musical theater, and um, I feel like I mean, I guess this is one reason why the viola is perfect for stuff like this. The versatility of what we can do with this instrument, I think that's one of the reasons why we see more contemporary musicians writing for this instrument because mm -hmm. of the instrument's versatility. I mean, Jennifer Stum talks about it in, the, in her TED talk about viola being the imperfect instrument, but through its imperfections, we find ways to achieve perfection in that sense. Even with stuff like Bollywood, like it's, it's cause I mean, Bollywood is not by any means obscure. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's, um, it's just us once again, trying to um, 
pull diversity into our instrument, um, which is super important with keeping these instruments alive. Um, and so, and so pulling stuff like Bollywood and stuff like that to, to appeal to a bigger fan base. Yes. Although, and I think with that, you can also expose various audiences to various styles. Like people who have never heard of Western classical will finally hear it. If they hear classical Western performer doing all these different styles or people mm-hmm. who solely know classical will now hear Bollywood because they're hearing a classical musician perform it. Right. Michaela, what's the most unusual piece you've encountered for viola in contemporary style? Because well. I think, I think you know, with Brazilian music, as cool as it is, it's not unusual in the sense because it's still written fairly traditionally. I think John was pushing limits with, you know, bluegrass in classical setting with scordatura and that the chopping and the jiving that you have to do with this piece. But mm-hmm. what, what about you, Michaela? What did you... What have you come across for viola repertoire? I pulled something a bit abstract. So I think first so. time I saw this, it was not the full thing. It was a segment because people were sharing it on Facebook. The Widman, W-I-D-M-A-N-N, Viola Concerto. Mm. So yeah, what makes this one interesting is the use of percussion, using the viola in different ways. So like how you were talking earlier. So he's starting out, you know, using the viola as a percussion instrument. It's just (laughs) texture and I, yeah. and I also like where he's standing too. Like, mm-hmm. well, he's standing you know? on. He moves. Yeah, there's like several. He playing in several different places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the piece, the piece I'm playing right now, that I'm going to put on my recital, Vandevate, Nancy Vandevate, who's alive still, by the way. But there's a whistling, a whistling part. But it's just sweet for viola. That's cool. Contemporary female composer. There's like not that many of them. And I'm glad that more and more they're coming to light. Yeah, but maybe I still... Joan Tower and mm-hmm. like the more, the really, really famous ones that came to light. Well, except I'm... for Dr. Beller. She needs to, she needs to write a solo viola work. Please. Make it on our chat. Dr. Beller. I feel like what would really set the precedent for like good programming is trying to find one contemporary work Mm -hmm. to put on recitals and i feel like we can you can push boundaries too because if we're talking about serious art music sort of expanding it can be stuff by film composers why not play like the suite to a film yeah because it's like it's already hard to find viola rep i think compared to the other instruments definitely what what we are in, which we call the modern age of music, which has basically been going since the early early twentieth century till now, which is a so much has happened, mm-hmm. like so many different genres have popped up in that. It's hard to pin exactly what is uh, our idea of contemporary classical music because it 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 spans so much to like uh film music branching all the way from John Williams to Corigliano to like other other composers like there's a huge range even within film music and um going all the way to using you know 18th century composition techniques all the way through serialism and electronic music and um so it's it's really hard to pin down exactly what's going on. So like we are we are seeing some pieces coming out. Like uh, Kenji Kenji Bunch doesn't necessarily write. Like none of his music is very grotesque. Um, he does he does try to do some sort of like fusion type of writing, um, genre fusion. But um, his stuff is usually always very tonal. And so it, it's really hard to just pin exactly what's going on right now. 
Well, I think it could possibly be, you know, just because of how connected we are on the internet. We have like everything, all of the tools, all of the genres, everything at our disposal. And I, you can relate it to like, you know, other mediums of expression. I feel like, and I feel like that sort of shift is necessary mm-hmm. because, you know, I don't know if you guys watch those violin channel 20 questions interviews with all these, you know, famous performers and the questions towards the end are always, you know, what's the future of classical music. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my head, I'm always wondering, are these people thinking of things such as what people have been sort of sticking to Puritan classical sort of, you know, here's your Bach, here's your Beethoven, here's your Brahms, or, you know, thinking beyond, um, thinking beyond, you know, just that. And it's funny because Kim Kashkashian says in this, um, this interview, she's like, I think we have to talk about written music that is interpreted and then performed Mm -hmm. that way. And that is what live performance depends on. So I think irrespective of what people are writing, I think as long as things are being written for us to perform for people, I think that is what keeps the art alive. And if it means that, you know, a Bollywood composer writes a Bollywood inspired suite for viola and orchestra or something like that, which would be a dream, you know, that can be played with a Brahms symphony in the same concert. And I think that's what would keep our art alive rather than just the need to listen to, you know, your favorite recording of a Brahms symphony all the time. And then there's the need to push away from the bourgeoisie. So what's on y'all's music stand? currently oh my gosh my uh, recital <laughs> well i'm i have gigs coming up <laughs> luis gustavo zago uh sweet quotidiana which is the modern piece that i'm doing and if you guys find more contemporary viola music please send oh it should we make them a playlist please check out links below we'll have yeah. links to a spotify playlist and we'll also have links to uh, a whole slew of viola repertoire uh, Mm -hmm. that needs to be performed absolutely and let us know what your favorites are yeah take care guys comments hi everyone my name is Brittany benton and i am a senior music composition major at unlv i'm currently writing a multi-movement work for Wind Sextet about gender inequality. This piece will have three movements, the first of which is called Left Behind. Left Behind is a slow and somber movement meant to impart the feeling of being left out or dejected, which are emotions that many women feel in today's society. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy this snippet of Left Behind. Hi, I'm Zach Arthur, um, and today I'm joined by Dr. Sean Penick, and we're going to talk through uh, one of her pieces, Birds of Paradise, that was part of her DMA commissioning project, or capstone project. Do you want to start by giving some background on the piece, Dr. Penick? Sure, I would love to. Um, As Zach mentioned, uh, this piece was one of the seven pieces that I commissioned to be written for me for my DMA recording project. And the whole point of the project was to create pieces that helped saxophonists begin to learn how to um, perform extended techniques. So each composer was given um, the option to choose one extended technique or in, try to include all of them in their pieces. And when we're talking extended techniques, you know, for saxophone, um, 
very commonly you'll hear things like altissimo or flutter tongue or growling or multiphonics, um, slap tongue, things like that. So in this piece, the composer, Sam Littman, is a saxophonist and he, he very much wanted to include as many techniques as he could in the piece. So he had free reign to include whatever he wanted. And yeah, what came out of it was this piece, Birds of Paradise for soprano saxophone. Why don't we start with the first extended technique? Because I notice um, right off the bat, you've got a false fingering going on in that second measure um, where the, I'm overblowing my B flat to that F and then I remove four and it becomes an F sharp. Mm -hmm. Is that just like a false fingering situation? So with this piece, I remember uh, one of the things that I talked to the composers about was um, including exercises within the music to help students prepare to do the extended technique. So we all know getting ready for altissimo or even just learning about oral cavity, we have students do overtone work. So with this one, this is actually, it's an overtone on the low B flat and you have to use it quite a bit because it is the main theme of the first etude. So yeah, so it's a lot about learning that oral cavity position um, that a student needs to be able to produce these extended techniques. Do you want me to give an example of what that would sound like? Yeah, how about, uh, why don't you just play from the very beginning and give us the theme. Sure. Right where I stopped, um, I noticed that I do a false fingering right into um, a multiphonic, and that that's also intentional. That's the same idea. Yeah, that's that's probably one of my favorite things about this piece is Sam's use of false fingerings um, that force you to manipulate your oral cavity into a very specific position to make the note sound or to make the pitch sound. And then he adds a fingering and a multiphonic just pops out because you're already in that position. So he's tricking you into doing the extended technique or doing the multiphonic, which I think is just magical. And I know students or saxophonists, when they play multiphonics for the first time, they go, I can do it. <laughs> so yeah, that was definitely um, intentional. I know having played a couple other pieces with multiphonics, this is like the easiest one I've learned. Um, cause when I think about when I, the first time I had to do it, it's really hard to figure out what's the voicing, which note do I have to focus on? Because I mean, in a multiphonic, sometimes there are four or more pitches. And so you have to figure out which note is important in, to get the multiphonic to speak right away. Right. It can be, it can be a struggle to get a student to learn where exactly to aim their air or what note mm -hmm. they should be trying to hear more. And in this piece, it's literally, he's doing the work for you and getting you to experience what it feels like to produce a multiphonic. Later in the piece, um, you've got a, a dyad where I'm glissandoing in and out of. Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of idea? Yes, this, I, this is my favorite part of the first etude because it forces the saxophonist playing it to really gain that control um, of the dyad, of the multiphonic. So it forces you to isolate the top note of the dyad, and then you move to the multiphonic, isolate it, and then you move down to the bottom note and isolate it. So you're gaining so much control just by learning to play this part. And while it is difficult at first, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's very satisfying once you get it, and I think it's very meditative to practice it at the same time. Um, but yeah, do you want to go ahead and try it? Sure, and, uh, yeah. See how it, how it sounds? Sure. That's it. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that is very satisfying to play once you get it, like just, and it sits there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so, it's so, it's such a neat sound too. 
Um, yeah, I noticed in the first movement also there are a couple other things that we can talk about. Um, sure, yeah. One of them being your false fingering trills um, at the bottom of the first page going into the second page. It's a trill, but I'm creating a bird sound um, just based off the fingerings that are created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the false fingerings, it, it, the whole first etude is definitely this kind of different sound world because we have, you're playing overtones, you have these like false fingerings um, that we would say, and it, it all has this, um, it all conjures this bird, this what could be a mating dance, if you will, or, and it's, it, you know, it's, it still sounds like soprano saxophone, but you're definitely invoking a different um, sound world and a different color as you're utilizing these different timbre trills. Mm -hmm. Do you want to play through the bottom? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. All right. I think it sounds like a bird. It does. Um, like, it reminds me of, like, that bird from Up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can we talk? There's just, like, because all of a sudden, um, in the third page, it goes mechanic. It suddenly changes to a mechanical sound. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming this has to do with uh, the sound world also. Do you wanna do you wanna do, play that transition? Maybe play from the odd tempo at the bottom of the second page and sure. move into the mechanically. I mean, this part, I've always kind of seen this, and perhaps you should ask the composer for what their inspiration on this part was, but I just always saw this as an extension of like the bird dance, the bird um, like kind of mating ritual. Yeah, because the, the title of this etude is mating dance. So it's, mm -hmm. it's progressed a bit and it becomes more rhythmic. So um, I guess one thing was, in terms of like sound of the piece or what the piece was about like a theme or a uh, something like that i didn't give the composers um any specific instructions in that way in that sense they were very free they could write about whatever they wanted there i definitely did not talk about birds with sam when he came up with this he just said hey i I created something and look at this, it's a, a birds of paradise. And I was like, this sounds amazing. But he came up with that idea on, all on his own. Yeah, and then I noticed in the second movement, um, there's just a little bit of growling. Yeah, Do you, would you like to uh, demonstrate that before we talk about sure. it? Maybe looking at... <laughs> I love growling. Um, I there's not a lot added in here, and that's yeah. great because this can be very taxing on a young student or a saxophonist who doesn't have a lot of background in it, a lot of background in vocalizing while playing. It's not something we really discuss, and there's not a lot of pedagogy written about it. A lot of people don't do it, and so it's it can be dangerous, and you can definitely fatigue yourself. So it's I think it's important to do it gradually mm -hmm. um very little at a time to not hurt the vocal cords um when i when i was working on this project it wasn't this piece but i was spending a lot of time vocalizing on another piece and i definitely overworked my throat and it was not it was not good but i also was doing it um incorrectly for a while i had to fix it so i think it's really important for students because there's a specific pitch written in right mm -hmm. on this one it's not just growl. It's not just um, create distortion. It's a specific pitch. So we're going for a G on the soprano saxophone. You're singing that note, and then you're mm -hmm. playing the B. And what's great about what Sam did is he included a G 
in the previous measure. It's mm -hmm. not for very long, but it's there. So your ear can catch it and you can begin singing it. And that's what I really loved about how he incorporated it into the piece. The thing I love that he's done in the second etude is he's connected it to the first. So the material at the end of the second etude reflects the material at the beginning of the first etude. Right. So it comes full circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really great. And I love the the tone of the second etude. I mean, the title of it, Love Denied, right away. You're just like, oh gosh, like heart pangs, right? Yeah. Um, and the way he's written it is so moving. Like I, I love, well, you look at the, the music itself, you look at the notes and it kind of just looks like a wash of notes, but then you play it and there's some, there's some really beautiful sounds that come out of it. I, I remember playing this on tour and when I was practicing it, people would stop in and go, Oh my gosh, what's that piece? Like I, I need to buy that piece. It sounds so cool. Um, yeah, I just, I can't say enough about Sam Littman and his composition. It's gorgeous. Thank you for having me today. This was fun. Thanks so much, Dr. Benick. Na, na, na. Na, 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 na. Hey, hey, hey. Many people who, uh, who are involved with UNLV know me through being one of the faculty uh, with the music technology department, which is what I spend a good amount of time doing uh, on the audio engineering side and on the mixing and the production side of things. But I guess going back, my my background really is in, in music. I was a, a drummer growing up uh, and, a, and a percussionist, I guess. I'd say probably more of a drummer. I was a, I grew up on rock and roll and, uh, you know, my favorite band when I was seven years old was Metallica. So I'm I'm not exactly born and raised in, say, like a classical setting, but I was always drawn to music that was kind of a little bit uh, deeper emotionally. And eventually, as I got older, got really into uh, film scoring and kind of classical. And for the most part, my whole life, I was self-taught. And then it wasn't until kind of later in life that I decided to go to music school. And I went to music school not knowing how to read music or... And I was never shown, been in a, in a traditional scene of music, being surrounded by, you know, amazing musicians. It was a bit daunting at first and ended up getting a, uh, a music degree. It was probably one of the hardest things I ever did just because I, I kind of started out probably the, the worst musician <laughs> surrounded by every, everybody else, it seemed like. But I knew I, I loved music and I knew I was inspired and I knew I had to get over the hurdle if I was going to get into any sort of cinematic music because um, my my favorite kind of music is kind of cinematic, epic, nerdy, the bigger and more grand and fantasy-like, uh, the better. Uh, that's always been my kind of like little kid coming out of me. And it's it's still to this day is the is the kind of fuel behind the fire. Because I was creative and, and composing music, I got into uh, production and just learning how to make my ideas come to life, which is, I think, how a lot of people end up getting bridged into the music technology to, or the, the technology side and the engineering side and how to produce. And I grew a liking to that. That's kind of my background, I guess, cinematic epic music that can, you know, put you into a fantasy world. And then the technological side of, of pushing knobs and making stuff sound cool. And, uh, and that's pretty much the background. It, if you understand this piece, it's very much me. I guess a little backing story on this is a, a girl and a guy from different parts of the world, and they both feel this otherworldly force that's drawing them together, and it's it's represented by this island that has like special, it's almost like taunting them with music and like serenading them and bringing them in as they go go to this place that's you know calling to them. So they have to battle uh, adversity. Obviously, they both kind of get beaten by themselves but then when they come together they can overcome adversity together and there's a dragon it's it's real nerdy it's like it's you've probably seen the story a million times but i just did my my version of it
music was first. It's actually a 20 minute long piece. That's like the really shortened version of it. You know, I made a small piece just to give it a visual to the story. I'm always thinking some type of visual when I'm composing. Most of that was programmed music, meaning virtual instruments. What's kind of common and something that I really like doing is using both real instruments and virtual instruments. Using sometimes just a solo cello on top of good programmed strings, it just kind of brings it to life a little bit. Sometimes the strings are a bit too perfect and it takes some of the life and some of the human sound out of it. So it's hard to kind of, you almost have to artificially create the, the imperfections. Just getting the, the emotion and the intimacy of, of people. It's almost when you're creating music, it's almost the, the bigger and more epic and kind of, you know, big scale it gets, the easier it is to pull it off with virtual instruments. The closer you get into more of an intimate, maybe like a chamber or string quartet or solos. It gets harder and harder to pull off the virtual thing. I don't think virtual instruments are replacing people. I think if there's kind of a wave where things are very virtual and very, I think it's more just kind of a fad. There's always going to be a need for real people playing the instruments. So I think that's kind of uh, reassuring for classical musicians, for people who are really spending the time to learn their instruments that there's always going to be a place for them. And I think as we move into the future, I only see it kind of going backwards. I think we've... We've almost maxed out our technical need for things. We've been exploring technology and virtual music and electronic music, you know, probably for a little bit and it's always going to be there, but I think we're starting to actually back up a bit and add a little bit more human element into it. So it's just going to be kind of a balance. It's like a pendulum going back and forth. We'll find a balancing point with that whole piece. It's just you know, a little bit of a balance of both. My composing comes from a real happy place. And it's funny because ironically, a lot of my music's not really happy music. It's more, you know, it, it's, it tends to be like emotional, deep, kind of dark sometimes, but it actually in the state, I'm like super happy doing it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny. If I'm not, you know, in a great mood, I'm really not that creative. And I kind of just want to, you know, take a break or take a nap <laughs> or something, you know? <laughs> There's some people that are more intrigued by the bad guy. Uh, for me, I've always been really in, you know, I was young. I was like little when I was discovering this, like my favorite movie was Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a super dark movie if you watch it. But like when I watched it, I was just like, yeah, it's, it was, it was just something I gravitated towards is kind of the darker deep. That's, I mean, that's like a pretty emotional, deep movie. It always hit like a, an emotional satisfaction to me. You know, and then there's some movies that are a little bit more surface level and a little bit more bubblegum, and those don't quite hit you deep enough in the the emotional response that it's like, it's it's not quite hitting you. And I think that that feeling of just getting like hit emotionally or or kind of overwhelmed with a big situation or something, that's always been kind of the the fun inspiring thing. And and it's more something I realized than I sought out. There's there's that feeling when you're for me like no matter what like when you get older it's almost like you have to constantly remind yourself that that beginning stages of when you first got excited about hearing a song you like and it's like this, the the sound of discovering a new song it, it brings you to life it gives you that energy that just puts you on cloud nine sometimes you know life as you know as, as i'm sure everybody knows things get complicated and you start losing that you know if you're trying to get a job or you're trying to get trying to get paid, you're trying to get notoriety, you're trying to put your name out there, you can get lost with that that one thing that is actually the thing that motivated you and excited you to do it in the first place. And you gotta like keep reminding yourself that. And I, I feel like that's always the thing that no matter what happens, if you can go back to that place of getting excited about music, then it kind of resets you. I like the feeling of just completely being overwhelmed with the music. And I remember, you know, Growing up, I would go to a rock rock concert and feel like the massive PA, so loud, so powerful, and just having like a bodily experience. And the funny thing is like, one of my favorite sounds in the world, you know, as a sound engineer, is the sound of when you're walking into, say, an arena, right? And it's like maybe even a hockey game, like the Golden Knights hockey game. And you just hear the place like rumbling, but you're not in it. It's just like from the distance, you just feel this massive power. It's just like raw 
energy. And that's actually kind of the music that I like will have an element of that. Even if it's not epic music, it's just the way, say, like a verse or a part of a song makes a transition. And it's almost like, oh, like the gates open up. You're like, oh, that part hit me. You know, it's kind of the same thing. It's just feeling like overwhelmed, like the music just kind of completely transformed you in a split second. I think it's important in my opinion, as a creative person to know the very specific point in a piece of music that is always the thing that gets you. And Brahms always did that where it's like, you listen, it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden he just changes it up. And you're like, oh my God, and you just kind of melt, you know, I think that's like my favorite thing in music. And if I can try to recreate that in any way, in a, in a way that just inspires me, then like, you know, that, then that's like my goal. Even though I'm a percussionist, I'm very melodically driven. Even when I was drumming, a lot of times I would be kind of singing along with my drumming. And I, I think actually that was one thing that drew me into really composition is because just playing playing drums, I, I could gel in with the music, but the melodic side of things was always interesting to me from an outsider's perspective. And that's why I went to school to like really study a little bit. And the ironic thing is I, I never studied composition. I was actually studying percussion and then through music theory and just being around music, I kind of just tried to get the, the basic foundation and the tools and understand basic harmony and I kind of just went with it. Uh, outside of teaching, I am a producer and I help uh, artists kind of produce their music, you know, through the technical needs. You know, right now I'm sitting in my, my home recording studio and you can see all the acoustic panels and stuff behind me and uh, Jack back here really kind of aiming towards uh doing a lot of production um i think there's a need for it because a lot of places are closing down and there's still a need where a lot of people if they're not gigging they're writing they're getting creative so there's definitely a need for people to uh have their ideas be helped out with the production phase of things if you have a creative vision even maybe orchestrally if you want to actually you know need help with mock-ups things like that or you know bring your ideas to life I do a lot of that, and if you guys can reach out to me if if, uh, if you want to be a part of it. Hi, I'm Caber Smith, and I'm a junior composition major. I'm presenting for you a clip of my song cycle called Orchid and Oleander, a very much work-in-progress piece based on the poetry of Christina Rossetti. Each movement of this song cycle is dedicated to a dog of mine who's died, and I chose Rossetti's poetry because it personifies death through the seasons and the birds in a way that easily suits an art song. So please enjoy the shortcut. for being here. My name is Sean Cleave. I'm the founding member of Clocks in Motion. I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Percussion quartet. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a professional musician. Hi, I'm Jen Beller and I'm the resident composer for Clocks in Motion Percussion Quartet. I am currently in the process of completing my composition for percussion quartet titled Oneira. Oneira is a variation of the word oneiric and oneiric is an adjective that describes things related to dreams. Those of you who've been hanging out in the stream the last couple of days have heard me practicing this. Uh, new work for Malakat with Percussion Quartet. Um, and we are gonna be workshopping Oneira, and I'm here to show off this uh, fancy instrument and uh, Jen Beller's uh, remarkable music. So thanks for being here.
it's really beautiful. I really enjoyed listening to it. I definitely got the whole dreamscape vibe. Like, where was your head at when you were writing all that? I kept thinking about wanting to write a piece that was inspired by the dream time. It's the last piece that I'm writing for Clocks that's going to go in this album that we're producing this semester. And then ultimately, I want to pair the track that we're going to record. I want to pair it with an animation. So what are the challenges and benefits to working with this kind of different instrument for a piece? The challenges for me with the Malakat uh, are that it's, it's an instrument that's really new to me, um, but not just the instrument itself. It's also just the entire realm of electronics. And, you know, before December of 2020, I basically hadn't even stepped foot in the realm of electronics at all, not even amplification, no electronic instruments. And so as soon as I got a hand, my hands on the Malakat, I was really excited, but it took me over a day to even figure out how to make a sound with the thing. You know, I, I was totally unfamiliar with MIDI controllers. I didn't know how these things worked. So I wasn't even aware that the instrument itself doesn't produce sound. Like the Malakat doesn't produce sound. It's actually the synthesizer that I'm powering with the Malakat. So I got the Malakat and I was like, oh, cool. But it doesn't make any sound. So now I have to go out and get another instrument to power it with. And then I need all these cables. It was just this whole avalanche of like things to learn. Um, but rather than get like completely stuck in the weeds of all the things this instrument can do, Right now, my goal with it is to just sort of have Jen write her music and me figure out how to play it on the instrument to the best of my ability and still allow it to be musical, resonant, expressive, all those things, despite it being electronic. And my, my whole world is in the acoustic environment. So I guess that's where I am with it. How are you using like what you've gathered from the acoustic world into this whole electronic world as you're learning to understand it. Well, this, this music actually came at a good time because my, my main project right now outside of Clocks of Motion and outside of this is I'm learning all 15 of the Bach uh, symphonias, the three-part inventions on marimba right now. And I'm going to record an album of that in the near future. I've got five of them under my belt, so I've got 10 more to go. And that music is highly contrapuntal, all one-handed, uh, one-handed melodic lines. You know, it's, it's all the stuff that's designed for piano, you know, so it's like very idiomatic scalar material. But on marimba, you have to do it all one-handed and usually with one stick. And so I got this music and I started looking, I was like, wow, this looks a lot like the Bach I was playing. <laughs> so I'm actually trying to take a lot of the inspiration I got, I'm getting from playing Bach and I'm trying to put that into this. It, I mean, it all goes hand in hand. The beautiful thing about the Mallet Cat is um, this instrument is not really widely used in new music. It's widely used in musical theater. And the whole idea behind the Malakat was to produce a MIDI controller that has the same type of sensitivity as an acoustic instrument. Um, it, it's a highly, highly sensitive device. Like most MIDI controllers only have 127 uh, degrees of sensitivity, and this has double that. And it also has two instruments on top of each other. Like it looks like one keyboard, but it actually functions as two. And so you can do you can do a lot with the instrument, um, like all this counterpoint and everything. I could never do this on an acoustic percussion instrument. I could never do this on a vibraphone. Even it's just it doesn't have as many options. So, um, but at the same time, there's a lot we do as percussionists that does not translate into the electronic world. Like, you know, like if I have a mallet, and depending on what angle I strike a surface with the mallet, if the mallet is flat on or if the mallet is tilted, it creates a different sound. Um, if, if I strike close to the center of the bar versus the edge of the bar, I'll, I'll get a different sound. Uh, same on drums, but on a mallet cat, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. The only thing the mallet cat is, is sensing is how hard I strike the surface. It's not s sensing anything about color or variance. So, so there's a lot of wasted motion potentially playing a thing like this because it's not going to, it's just not going to pick up on the sensitivity of how hard, how like tightly I'm squeezing the mallet. It's just not going to pick up those things the way my marimba or vibraphone will. You were talking about synthesizers and messing with that. Have you been doing a lot of that with the mallet cat? Yeah, everything you're hearing, all the sounds you're hearing is through this, uh, this little bitty synthesizer here. It's a uh, Roland JDXI. It looks like a toy in person. It's just a little red synthesizer, but it's amazing the, the power you can get out of a synth like that. A lot of what I'm doing with all the music for this album is programming to get the instrument to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And that, I didn't know how to do any of this until, you know, very recently. Well, that's impressive that you've learned it so 
quick. Um, what what really just like inspires you both to like collaborate together and join together and make this music like what's the most exciting thing about all this i guess i wake up every morning and i'm excited to compose more music for clocks and i get excited to meet with sean over twitch and i get to work with them in a rehearsal setting the end of march we have a recording project to look forward to and it's just such a wonderful experience working with them. Well, well, thank you. I feel the same way. And I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to say much, but I, I mean, as far as the project Clocks of Motion is concerned, this is the stuff I look forward to the most, which is always uh, the building process, right? Whether it's the very beginning of working with a composer, new pieces, you get the stuff going, or that first rehearsal with the group, there's something about that kind of nervous energy of going into a first rehearsal or something like that, that is just really intoxicating for me. I just keep coming back for more. Um, but on a more personal level, this whole collaboration was all about sort of a progression for us as a group and also for you as a composer of like, well, what is that, what is that next piece going to sound like? It wasn't about a one and done, like here's the, here's the commission, write the piece, we're done. This is like a multi-year process we're going to have a great album to come out of it. So it just feels like we're in the best moment now. And so like when I get this score and I see all this counterpoint and like, I don't know, it just makes you really excited about like what this is all going to sound like when it gets put together. So that's where I am with it. That's what, um, that's what inspires me to continue working on it. And um, we got a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but it's, it's fun and it's, it's exciting work. So I've heard your guys' collaborations like a, few pieces online and they're really beautiful so i i really can't wait to hear like the finished product of this it's i'm i'm speechless with how beautiful it is honestly so thank you for sharing it with me i feel pretty honored thank you melanie all right well should we get to work yeah, yeah. let's do it <laughs> all right It's, it's really, it's going to be something really special. Conrad and today we are doing Composer Spotlights. Starting it off this semester, Logan Strong! <laughs> so Logan, tell us a bit about yourself. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Logan Strong. I am a composer here at UNLV. So Logan, what have you been working on this semester? So this semester uh, I'm working on a couple things, you know, in main orchestration and stuff like that. Just some uh, background stuff, but uh, last semester I actually worked on one big piece and that's the piece that's going to be spotlighted right after this. Um, uh, I'm creative with titles, so it's just called Theme and Variations. So having to balance orchestration and your honors college, as well as Nextet, and this Theme and Variations, how's that been going? It's been, it's been interesting, uh, especially because these last couple semesters obviously have been all online, and so there's a, there's a completely different mindset there. You have a completely different, like, you know, uh, just a completely different time management set of skills, really. Uh, and so it's been, it's been interesting, it's been very different, but uh, I, think I'm, uh, I think I'm surviving, more or less, uh, and I think I've managed to 
like I said, manage my time well and, and figure out what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Absolutely. Do you have any tips for young composers that are in a bunch of classes and can't time manage? Um, I have found my f the, the thing that has kept me on track the most is uh, my calendar on my phone. I put all of my classes in there, I put all of my deadlines in there, I, put, I schedule my entire day, I have blocks of time when I'm composing, I have blocks of time when I'm working, all of this stuff that I schedule out as much as possible. And it's not that you have to stick to that schedule, you can kind of go off and, and if you have to change things around, you have to change things around. But it's, it's great to have that set of something so you never feel like you don't know what to do. No matter what time it is, no matter what you're doing, you have something you can do. Or if you have something else that you want to prioritize over that, you can switch it around. So tell us a bit about theme and variations. Um, so like I said, as the name implies, theme and variations, um, it was sort of this, uh, this project that uh, Dr. Beller and I came up with. Basically, um, I want to go into primarily like film composing and stuff. And so we figured the best way to sort of practice that out would be write a theme and, and treat this theme as the character, and then tell an entire story just in how you vary the piece, um, just in how those, those variations work out. So uh, I hope I did that pretty well, that, that the, the theme stays exactly the same and the, the variations tell the story along the way. Tell us a little about this character that you created with the story. So, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting balance of what is in there and what isn't in there. Um, but uh, hopefully, hopefully all these pieces, people can see how they line up. So it's the story of this sort of uh, princess from a warrior culture. And uh, basically, it starts out with um, basically like a coronation. And there's this very regal organ piece. Uh, that starts out the theme, and then you get this sort of sorrowful strings, uh, and that's sort of the, uh, the, obviously, someone had to die to make her be crowned as the leader, and so sort of a mourn mourning of their death, and then the, the battle begins, and, and she goes to battle to avenge that, that family member. And then at the very end, uh, she dies in the battle. But obviously, as, as a warrior culture, sort of Viking inspired, that like she gets to go to Valhalla. She gets to go to the warrior's afterlife because she died in battle and died honorably. Interesting. OK. So how has this piece differed from previous pieces in the past? I am I'm a fairly diatonic composer. I like to, you know, if I pick a scale, I like to try and stick in that scale more or less. Um, and if I ever go out of the scale, it's, it's for a reason. And um, this time around, I just, the, the melody that I was writing just ended up wandering through all these different keys and scales and ended up not really, it's kind of in C, um, but also like I just went ahead and threw in as many flats as I, as I felt it needed to have. And um, so it was a very different experience. Um, that was a style of writing I've never done before. And, um, and the sort of writing the melody independent of the harmony so that the the harmony and the melody can change separately was a was a bit different of an experience as well so what is your major exactly so uh my major is uh civil engineering um uh and you get to pick a focus and my focus is sort of in uh, structural and railroad engineering Ooh, okay so how do how does music help you with your engineering and vice versa I think the biggest thing is I've, I've not found a lot of direct overlap, you know what I mean? Like, there are a lot of people who say, oh, you can find inspiration in anything, and it just, I don't know, I don't, I don't think like that, I suppose. The biggest thing has been sort of the mindset of it, that um, it's, it's interesting to think about that when I'm doing an engineering problem, it's you take the, the formulas that you know and the, the equations and all this stuff that you have as knowledge, and try and find the ways that you can sort of adjust them and fit them together in order to get the answer or to, to solve the problem or get whatever it is you need to get. Um, and I think it's interesting that in reality, that's kind of what we do when we're composing, because we have all of these 
theoretical tools, right? You know, you have the, the scales that you know and the, the, the different rhythms that you like and instruments that you like and whatever. And you know all of these little pieces. And what you're doing is you have an idea and you're trying to find a way to fit all those pieces together and to, to express that idea. And I think it's, it's, that's the biggest thing that sort of influenced both of those worlds is realizing that that, that process is the same it doesn't matter if it's something that people consider a more creative field versus a more like science and math heavy field. Like really the, the thought process there is exactly the same. Absolutely. So speaking of inspiration, what, what inspires you to compose? You mentioned the story of this warrior princess uh, eventually going to Valhalla, um, other projects that you've worked on and the inspiration behind those, but what inspires you? So um, as, I, as I mentioned, I kind of like, um, I'm kind of mostly interested in the film composing world. And I think a lot of this comes from the fact that when I am composing, I am telling a story. And that's, that's just how my brain works. That's how I think about music, is I am tell, trying to tell a story. And so really what ends up happening is I try and write a story first. Before I, even, before I even sit down at the piano, before I start writing anything, I sit down and I try and think of, okay, what's a story that I can tell? What are the characters that are involved? What images do I want to evoke? What, what kind of emotions do I want to talk about here? And I, I take that first, and then I can sit down and think, okay, now that I have the, the ideas that I want to express, now that I have the story down, now I can start putting those pieces together. Now I can think, okay, I know I want to evoke this kind of mood, so let me go for this scale, and I know that these chords work really well, and that's where the creativity of translation comes in. But I think ultimately my in biggest inspiration comes from the idea of let's, let's make characters, let's make a story, let's make a, let's make a moment in, in a story, and let's explore that as though, as though that story were the film and I were scoring that film. Well, that sounds amazing. And we cannot wait to hear your work and the work that you will come out with in the future. So where can we find you? Um, so I guess we can, since we're on YouTube, we can throw links in the, uh, in the description and probably up in the, the card, I don't know, wherever it goes, one of, one, of these, one of these corners. I never know if the video flips or not. Um, but uh, uh, I have a YouTube channel. That's where I post most of everything. I have things like uh, you know Bandcamp and SoundCloud and stuff, but really YouTube is just easiest for me. Um, and then I don't I don't really tend to have many other social media. I'm not that kind of a not the the social media kind of person. I don't know. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today, and thank you so much for telling us a bit about your piece. Cut to peace. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys for giving me this uh, this chance to talk about it. And yeah, I hope everyone I hope everyone likes it.
Thank you so much for watching the entire video, and a reminder, if you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And for those of you who did the 100 subscriber challenge, here's your shout out. Shout out to Vampire Mac Daddy, John Rose, Zane Douglas, Sydney, Rizwan Jagani, James Doyle, Andrew Vasquez, James Dahl, Dmitro Gnativ, and Colin Salmon. I really hope I pronounced your names right, and thank you guys so much for subscribing. We hope to see you next time on the next Next Head Variety Show. Bye!